Thank you. God, thank you for this day. Thank you because we can be together here. Thank you for what you're going to do the next two, three days here, God. God, we love you, and Jesus, we want to be your disciples, and we want to live the life you call us to. Pray that you come with your Holy Spirit and open our eyes and our ears and help us to know you. Thank you because we are going to see your power and your kingdom come. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start with, with uh, the word disciple. What a disciple is, is, is behind me. First thing, we look at the word dis- disciple and the word Christian. Just from the beginning, we don't like this word. Bad word. Can you say that to yourself? Bad, bad word. <laughs> no, we don't like the word Christian because it's a word that has been misused a lot. There's many people we hear out in the world today who say, hey, I'm a Christian. And if you ask, why? Because I got baptized as a baby. Or because uh, I'm a member in a church. Or because I sit in church on Sunday. Jesus never used the word Christian. Not one time it came out of his mouth. He did not say, go out in the world and make people Christian by baptizing them as a baby or sit them in a church on Sunday or, or, or something like that. He said, make disciples. Disciples. Disciples of Christ. People who follow Christ. People who leave something behind to follow him. And he used that word again and again and again. And when we read in the Bible, in the Gospels, what he said to people who want to follow him, you saw that it was radical. It was like people need to leave things to follow him. And it was not everybody who was ready. There was a young, rich ruler who wanted that life. And but what Jesus said, okay, if you want this life, then sell everything you have and give it away and come and follow me. Come and be my disciple. And what did he choose? He chose to not follow Jesus. Jesus did not run after him and say, come on, I did not mean it. It's not like that. <laughs> come on. No, he did not do that. And because of that, that man, he missed many exciting things in his life because he was not willing to give up everything to follow Jesus. So the only word there is, the only thing we should is be disciples of Christ. But try to hear this. Hey, I'm a disciple of Christ. Why? Because I got baptized as a baby. Or I'm a disciple of Christ because I sit in church on Sunday. We know by just changing the word from Christian to disciple, suddenly it becomes so much more radical. And it shows what it's all about. It's about Jesus, about following him. So the word disciple did not exist at that time and it should not exist today. In the word Christian, it's all about being a disciple. But the word disciple today is also different in many ways because the word disciple today has become a religious word. We only use that word disciple inside churches. If you go out on the street today and say, be ask, hey, what do you do? Hey, I'm a disciple. They will look at you like, what? <laughs> I like, what are you? Because we only use this word in church. But at Jesus' time, the word disciple was a common word. Jesus had disciple. John had disciple. The Pharisees had disciple. Moses had disciple. Many people at that time had disciples. So it was not a religious word and almost like a cult and something strange as it is today. At that time, it was normal. So if we should try to retranslate the word disciple and really explain what it's all about, the best word for us to use is apprentice. Apprentice. I have it here. We become our apprentice. We said yes. We say yes to follow Jesus to become his apprentice or his disciple. And if you look here, I have a sign here. You can take the next one. Next one. There. It's not me, but it could have been me. Some years ago, I started as an apprentice, as a baker. I started an apprenticeship as a baker. Or discipleship as a baker. 
How did I learn to become a baker? How did I become a baker? I was not the baker for the first day. My master was the baker. I was his disciple. I was his apprentice. He was the baker. I was not. But by for me to follow him, for me to work with him, for me to follow him three and a half years, I will end up becoming like my master. I will end up becoming a baker. And the Bible, there, there is a verse here I, I, I just found here. In Luke 6, 40, it's written that a disciple is not above his master. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his master. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I apprentice, or a disciple is not above his master, but everybody who is fully trained. I don't have that. Just go back to the beggar thing. Everybody who have, who have been fully trained will be like his master. It looked like this. Some years ago, okay. Some years ago, I was not the baker, but then I started my apprenticeship. I came to my master. Can I follow you? And he looked at me and said, yes. And then I started my apprenticeship where I learned. I learned to bake bread. I have no idea how baking bread, the, how it works in the beginning. I've never done it before. And many times it was hard in the beginning. It was like, oh, I'm never going to learn that. And my eye, arms was like not used to work. So it was not easy to use my hands the way I did it. Did I make mistakes? Yes. Sometimes, no, many times. Often I, I forgot to take things out of the oven and it burned down. I forgot to put things in the bread and we had to throw it out. And sometimes my master, he was not happy. He was shouting and sometimes things was flying through the room uh, and I wanted to hide in the corner. But I learned. I learned and I learned and I learned and I become more calm and I become better. And in the end I could make many things. I could make a beautiful wedding cake. If I started making a wedding cake the first day, nobody will get married because it would be the most ugly wedding cake you have ever seen. But I learned and I became like him. The same way with Jesus. We, that day, that time we said yes, that day we repent, that day we get baptized, we get baptized to him. And we say yes to a discipleship, to our apprenticeship. We said yes, not just to sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and listen, listen, listen and never do. No, we said yes to follow him with one goal is to become like him. And try to imagine me as a baker apprentice. Try to imagine after three years, somebody, my boss came to me and said, hey, Tom, okay, I would like you to make that wedding cake. No, 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 no. I, I have not learned anything. I don't know how to. I, I'm just looking at you do it. No, you are going to do it. No, 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 no. I, I don't know how. Then there must be something wrong. Because the whole idea, the whole purpose with our apprenticeship is to learn and become like him. This is the purpose. If I, after three years, still are sitting in one corner and do absolutely nothing... There's something wrong with the job. There's something wrong with my master. There's something wrong with me. Or try to imagine that, that my boss, he came the first day and said, Tom, I want to give you a book. This is the book, big book of Danish pastries. This is the big book of making bread and baking cakes. Read this book. And try to imagine if I in three years was studying the big book of baking. So after three years, I knew everything that was about baking bread. But I'd never done it. I knew it. Never done it. No experience, but I have a lot of knowledge. And after three years, he comes to me and says, have you read the book? <laughs> yeah, I have. Fine. Here's the key. Here's the bakery. Start baking. Do you know what would happen with me? I would be filled up with fear. I will take the key and I'll go into bakery and I'll look around and I'll think, oh no, what do I do here? 
Because actually, I have never put my hands into it. I've just got a lot of knowledge. I've just read a lot of things about it. But I have never actually done it. So I have a lot of fear and a lot of doubt. Can I actually do it? But of course, outside in the real world, it never worked like that. Because outside, if you want to learn to build houses, want to fix cars, want to be an electrician, want to be a baker, no matter what education you do outside the church, the whole way of learning, the whole way of teaching is hands-on. You are, you get a lot of little, little knowledge, you see your master do it, and then you do it yourself. And maybe the first one, two, three times the master is standing behind you, beside you, so he can say, no, 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 don't, not that, that way. Do it like this. Ah. And then after a few times, you know how to do it yourself. So out in the real world, they know that you never learn how to do it just by looking at others do it. You never learn how to do it by just reading books. You only learn how to do it by putting your hands into it. And everybody outside the world know that. The only place where we don't know that is inside the churches. <laughs> we think, oh, we don't know how to do it. Let's do one more conference and see one more guy do it. But this is not how we learn. Another thing is that, <laughs> sorry, but we have somehow accepted that it's okay to have become, be, been a disciple for five, ten 20 years and still don't know how to do it. We have accepted. So if, if I come with, with somebody who are new in the faith, who need healing, who need deliverance, who need the Holy Spirit, who need to get baptized, who need everything, and I come and say, this is for you, can you lead him to Christ, baptize him, make disciples out of him? Most people will say, no, no, but I bring him to the pastor or do something else. We have accepted, we have actually accepted it's okay not to grow. But it's not okay. It's actually not okay to have become disciple for many years and have not grown. But it's okay to make mistakes because that's part of the job. It's part of the job to make mistakes because nobody learns how to walk without trying to fall a few times. And the best way to learn often is to make mistakes. Because then you remember what you should not do next time. <laughs> and the same when it comes to this disciple life. So, so say to yourself, look, have that thought that I am a disciple of Christ. And it's okay. It's okay I do not look exactly like Christ now. But it's not okay I don't look more like him now than I did last year. It's not okay. Because as you grow, as you grow, as you grow. If you look at Jesus' disciple, you, you, you almost, I read how my master was. Sometimes he was angry, and you almost see the same with Jesus. At one time, Jesus' disciple brought a boy to Jesus who had a demon. And Jesus' disciple could not cast out that demon. Jesus did not look at the boy and rebuke the boy and say, what is wrong with her, you? He did not look at his disciple and say, hey, the reason you cannot cast that out, demon out is because this is a difficult demon and you have to do like this. No, he just he cast that demon out and then he rebuked his disciple. And he's all like, my ma master, come on, how long shall I keep up with you? You have been walking with me for some years now, you still don't know how to cast that demon out. But what did we see later in the book of Acts? Later we saw that everybody who came to his disciples got set free. Everybody. So there was a time with Jesus' disciples where they failed. They could not do it. But later we saw they did it. The same with me and us. There's many times where we fail and we cannot do it. And it's okay. If we don't stop there and accept it, but we continue to grow and we continue to learn. If we then look about our disciple life again, many people think that our biggest challenge is we have a lot of fear. <sighs> fear, I'm not like that. Oh, I, I cannot do like this. Anybody sometimes think, oh, I need more boldness? I want to say our problem, to be honest, is not lack of boldness. You are very bold. Come on, you, you, you are much more bolder than I am. You are. 
Well, I, if I take you two women there, I know you are so much more bold than I am. You are. You are so much more free than I am. More free and more bold. Okay, may, maybe, maybe do not come with maybe cast out demon or preaching, but, but other things for example. Let's say washing clothes. Well, to be honest, I, if I should wash clothes today, if I should wash clothes today, it was like, okay, uh, what is the dishwasher and what is the washing machine and how do I do it and what colors go together? I would be so nervous and I would, I would sweat and it would take all my energy if I should wash clothes. Why? Because I got married very early and I've never learned how to wash clothes. <laughs> then, uh, the, the same when it comes to making food. If I should make food, it's like, uh, how do I do it? Some of you, you got to do, 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 and speak the telephone at the same time, and, and do think things at the same time, wash clothes and make food, and you do it, and you are so free when you do it. Why? Why are you so free and I'm not? i tell you why. Because you, because every time you wash clothes, every time you make food, there's coming a special washing clothes anointing over you. <laughs> or special making food anointing. So you are standing there and you are waiting. Come, sir. Come on, Holy Spirit. Come, sir. Holy Spirit. Come on. Come on. And suddenly you feel the Holy Spirit and you wash clothes and you just do it. Do it like that? <laughs> why, why are you free? Why are you bold and I'm not? Because you have more experience than I have. So boldness, freedom, do not come with a special anointing or special gift. Boldness and freedom come with experience. Because everything I do today, I, I remember first time. But I remember first time I prayed loud. Do you remember you prayed loud? I remember I was, I was new in the faith and I came to a prayer meeting. We are six people together and we are going to, and, and I wanted to pray loud now. I've been at three prayer meetings and now I wanted to pray loud. So I was standing there. I did not hear what other people was praying. I was just creating a prayer in my mind. <laughs> okay. And I was like, okay, now it's crying. Now it's my turn. No, okay, somebody's praying. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, okay, come on, I want to pray loud now. And I was waiting and then, God, thank you for a good day today. Amen. <laughs> And I was sweaty all over and I could change the t-shirt because it was so hard. <laughs> but now I'm relaxing it. Why? Experience. I'm more free. I remember the first time I prayed for a sick person. It was somebody who had, who had problem with the backs and the legs was not the same length. I have no idea what I was doing actually because I had been at a meeting where there was another guy who was the one praying for people. And then one woman came this day and said, hey, this guy, is he here today? No, no, he's not here. And then she said, oh, I have a problem in the back and the legs, and I want him to pray for me. I can pray for you. <laughs> and she said, can you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. But inside, I was like, oh, no. And I said, yeah, yeah, just sit down. And she sat down and I took the legs and they were not the same length. I said, outside I was smiling and relaxed. And now, uh, inside I was scared. Oh. I said, now, now I pray and the legs go to come on. Please God help me. <laughs> and I prayed and I was, come on, come on, come on. But the leg did not go out. The other leg went in a state. <laughs> and I did not expect that to happen. So I became so afraid. So I dropped the knee feet, and fall down. And I like, but what happened? She got healed. Then later, I got more experience. Later, I met a guy who also had a problem in the legs. In the, the back and the legs, legs were not the same length. And I asked, how much is it? I said, oh, only, and only, he said, there's like one centimeter. And I took the legs off and I checked. And there was not one centimeter. It was like almost nothing. But I said, okay, I, I just pray. And then I prayed and then the leg came out and now they're the same length. And I smile. And then the leg continues to grow. Yeah. 
And suddenly there was one centimeter, just the other side, just the other side. And I was like, oh no. So I dropped the leg and said, okay, I think it's fine. I'm, I'm, I want to run away. But he, stand, he stood up and he walked. He said, whoa, thank you. And he took the shoe off and he took a piece out of one shoe and threw it out and he was healed. And I thought, whoa, God is in control. But then you more experience, you more relax, you become in it. First time, it was a woman who, with a demon, it was a woman who fell down and, and spoke like with a big man voice, go to hell. <laughs> and when I saw that, my first experience was, ah, a demon, I need a priest. <laughs> so I was like, I was thinking, I need a priest. Why I've never done this before? But because it happened in our living room, there was no priest. There was that woman laying on the floor, there was me and there was the girl hiding behind the sofa. <laughs> and she was afraid behind the sofa and she was laying on my floor and there was only me, so what to do? And I heard like, go to hell. And I was like, so I was like, uh, who, who are you? <laughs> and I heard again, go to hell. And I was like, oh no. So I said, no, I don't want to go to hell. You can go to hell. And then, and she got set free. And I was like, Ah, it's working. Hey. <laughs> but then you get one experience, and then one more experience, and then one more experience, and after some experience, you experience more peace. You are more relaxed because you know more how to do. Can you follow me? Last thing, just think of your job right now. The thing you are doing every day now. Just think back when you started the first day. Everything was new for you. The first day you came in and every information was new and you think, I'm never going to learn this. Do you remember? Yeah. And then after a half year, you knew what you were doing and then there came a new guy and you looked at him. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and you forgot that you were exactly like him a half year ago. <laughs> the same when it comes to follow Jesus. So we are not perfect. We are disciples. We are princes. And our job is to try to learn how to do it. But then it's important that we have a place where we can practice. Because you need a place to practice for you to learn. And this is the challenge with the way we do churches today often. Because I, I'm, I'm a guy who's often staying in preaching in churches and preaching like here with a mic in my hand. How many in this room is doing like me, who's often preaching with a mic in your hand or with your hand? There is one, two, three, four, five, six. There is around six, seven people here who are often preaching in churches. And we love it, don't we? Yeah, come on. It's nice. Everybody loves to be used, don't you? But the problem is there's only five, six, seven people here in this room with, with uh, almost 300, 250 who have a platform where we can preach. What about the rest? And this is where we need to look at what Jesus really has said, because it's not about what happened here. It's not about the platform. It's not about the church. It's not about the Sunday meeting. It's about our life. Because if I, I asked before, how many do often preach in a church? There's only five, six, seven hands. How many people here have a living room at home? Everybody have a living room. How many here have a bathtub? How many here sometimes go shopping? How many here don't like to shop? Okay. <laughs> well, so when we talk about how many have a church and preach, it's only a few hands. If I talk about how many have a living room, it's heavy hand. How many have a bathtub? How many know who have a bathtub? No involved. How many go shopping? But yeah, it's not about this. It's about knowing that Jesus wants to be part of our everyday life. It's about getting him into our living room, getting him into our kitchen. A kitchen is not just a place where we make food and talk. A kitchen is a place where we preach. We, yeah, I've preached in kitchen. I've cast out demons in a kitchen. I've healed the sick in a kitchen. I've baptized people in Holy Spirit in a kitchen. Normally, I say the only thing I've not done in a kitchen is baptize people in water because the sink is too small. 
But now we are baptized people in water in the kitchen because we just take a belly bain in the water and in the kitchen and fill it up and baptize people there. And, and this is what we need to see, that Jesus wants to be part of our everyday life. And we're going to look at, I'm just going to introduce now Luke chapter 10, if you can get that up. Because in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is saying something important to us. Before we go through this, look here. Try to imagine, look at me. Try to imagine that I'm Jesus now some years ago. And I said to my disciples, I would like you to go out and do this, 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 and this. Okay. And they went out did, and do, did this, 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 this. Then I said to them, before I left them, now I want you to make disciples of other people, telling them to obey everything I have commanded you. Telling people to do this, 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 this. And they said, yes. So they went out now and said to people, hey, do you want to follow Jesus? Yes. Jesus has then commanded you to do this, 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 this. And they make disciples of new people and say, Jesus, do you want to follow Jesus? Yes. Jesus has commanded us to do this, 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 this. But the interesting is today that Jesus has commanded us to do this, 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 but we are actually doing this, 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 this instead. We are doing something that's so different from what Jesus is doing. And therefore, we have to go in and see what have he actually said to us? What have he commanded us to do? And this calling, the calling for the 12 disciples or the calling for the 70, as we are seeing in Luke chapter 10, is not only a calling for them at that time. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's calling that time is the same today. And very often our problem is that we do something totally different than he has commanded us to do. And if you look at Jesus' life, it's like, we often think, what is a Christian? Oh, a Christian is somebody who dresses up every Sunday and goes to church. <laughs> not only that, because there was many things Jesus did and many things he did not do. One of the things he did not do was dress up every Sunday and go to church. I don't say it's, it's wrong, but it's more about our everyday life. What did Jesus do? He was led by the Holy Spirit. He went out. He sat in houses of people, in their houses. He eat and drink what they serve. He sat there, and then he healed the sick and cast out demons, and he preached the gospel. And the Pharisees, the religious people, often had a problem with Jesus because he was sitting in the house of sinners. But he said, why is he there? Because the sinners need forgiveness and the sick need healing. Now we are Jesus' body here on earth, and we are actually called to do the same. And this is where the kingdom of God, the church, is growing, when everybody starts to do it. What have Jesus said in Luke 10? The first thing he said is the harvest is plentiful and ripe. He said ripe in, in John 4. But the harvest is plentiful and the harvest is ripe. Is that good news? Yes. So as you imagine, I'm a farmer now. I'm looking over the harvest. And, and you are the harvest. And I'm standing here looking over the harvest and I see a plentiful, ripe harvest. Come on, it's good news. What do I then do? The harvest is ready. The harvest in Ireland is ready. In England, all over the place, the harvest is ready. It's ready. There's people out there who are ready to receive Jesus. The harvest is not the problem. The harvest is ready. And I'm the farmer. I look over the harvest. Okay, the harvest is ready. What do I do? What do I do? Ah, I open the barn door. And now the barn door is wide open. And say, harvest? The barn is open and the barn is empty. Harvest, you can come in. Come on. Harvest, come in. Harvest. Harvest. And I'm standing shouting over the harvest, come in, harvest. And the harvest do not come in. And then I can start to think what is wrong with the harvest. There's, of course, nothing wrong with me. The harvest, there's something wrong with the harvest because... The barn is open, the barn is empty, and the harvest do not come in. But then I get idea, now I know what is wrong with the harvest. <laughs> the barn is dirty. 
No harvest wants to be in a dirty barn. So I cleaned the barn up and I put uh, music in, soft Hillsong music and light and chairs and coffee machines. And, and I make the harvest in the barn so nice and said, harvest coming. But the, the harvest don't care how the barn is looking. And no matter how fine we do it inside the barn, the harvest will not stand up and walk in because it have never been created for that. We, as workers, need to go out there where it is and get it. And we have to understand that harvest is not the problem. The harvest has never been the problem. And another thing, Jesus said, I have all power in heaven and earth. If Jesus has all power in heaven and earth, how much power do Satan have? Nothing. Nothing. So Jesus has it all and the harvest is ready. Why, do, why don't we see more then? The problem is not the harvest. The problem is not lack of power. The problem is the workers. The workers are few. We are the problem. I've been traveling in many cities and countries now, and I have often come to a church and come to a place where they say, oh, welcome to our city and our church and this place. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really hard ground here. It's, it's really those people here. Oh, Ireland, oh, Catholic, Protestant fight. Oh, it's so difficult here. I go to Rome, uh, Poland. Oh, Poland, oh, Catholic, it's so hard here. Go to Romania, oh, also the Catholic here. Mafia, oh, it's so hard here. Every place I go to Denmark, oh, Denmark, oh, we have so good country. No, it's so hard here. Every place I go, I always hear a lot of excuses for why things do not happen. And the excuses have always to do with the harvest. Or I go a place and say, oh, we need more anointing and more power and Maybe we should invite a big evangelist for America to come to lay hands on us so we can shake and get a new anointing and suddenly we can do it. This is what I hear. But this is not what the Bible says. I have never met anybody come to a place and say, welcome to our city, welcome to this place. Nothing is happening here. And the reason is because we are so lazy. <laughs> we are so busy with our own life and we are so lazy and we don't go out in the harvest and we are not good workers and we are not seeing what Jesus really call us to and therefore nothing is happening. But welcome here. <laughs> well, I've never heard that, but that is the truth. That is what the Bible is saying. The harvest is ready. But this is also good news because we can do something about it. Try to imagine if it was only up to God. Try to imagine we need to wait like, like a generation to get a revival again. And try to imagine like the, the, the revival will come like a, from the ocean, like a bit, big wind. And it's flowing over Ireland, toward Ireland. And we are thinking, yeah, it's coming to Ireland and suddenly go into England instead. Those from England, yes, and those from Ireland. Uh. <laughs> and then we have to wait one more generation before we see it again. This is the thought. We don't have to wait for anything. The harvest is ready. It's been ready 2,000 years and it's ready today. The problem is not the harvest. The problem is not we need a lot of anointing, a lot of gift. We just need the Holy Spirit and obey God. And when we start to do that, we will see the kingdom of God is growing. Amen. And we have testimony of that because we now see thousands of people getting healed, 10,000 people getting healed, and thousands of people getting saved all over the world by normal Christian disciples who start to do it. And this is how the kingdom of God is growing. So the harvest is not a problem. And then he said the workers are few, and we should therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to go. But this is not enough. Because after he said, go, pray, and pray for the Lord of how to send our workers, he said, go. We should also go ourselves. And then he said something interesting. See, I'm sending you out as lamb among wolf. Do you have uh, sheep here in Ireland? Yeah. How, how many uh, sheep, uh, uh, for, uh, what do you call it, shepherd? Do you know who take his sweet little lamb and send them out among wolf? Do you know a, a shepherd? Do you know a shepherd out there who take a sweet little lamb? Oh, look at this cozy little lamb. 
It's so sweet, it's so weak, it almost just walk on the legs. And then you open the big door out in the forest, and then there's a lot of wolf out there. He said, sweet little lad, come on, I'm with you. Come on, sweet little lad, out to the wolf, out to the wolf. How many farmers do you know as sheep uh, what do you call it? Shepherds. How many shepherds do you know do that? I only know one is Jesus. <laughs> this is what he said. I sent you out as lamb among wolves. But what good shepherd in his right mind could do something like that? Could take his weak lamb. And you know a lamb is not like, bruh, it's like, <laughs> man. There's nothing dangerous with a lamb. It's not a good cam camouflage like white wolf on a black field. It's not a smart animal. It's not very fast. It, it, they don't have a big brawl. It's a lamb. It's weak. What shepherd will do that? I tell you, the shepherd who is going with the lamb. And this is what Jesus is saying, go. And then he say, see, I am with you to the end of the world. So yes, he sent us out as lamb among wolves. When do we experience that Jesus is real in our life? When we go out. In that moment, we take those steps. We will see that he's with us. Not before. We can sit and talk about it. We can sit and dream about it. But the word really become alive. In that moment, we actually start to do it. And every time we are going to do it, it's the same again and again, even after many years. Every time we take that step. Are you with us? Are you sure? Jesus, are you there? And what do we see? We see the wolf. He don't remove the wolf. He not say, hey, wait, little lamb, till I remove all the wolf, and then you can go out. No, he take us and send us out in the middle of them. And out, the wolf is there, and they are putting fear in us. Meat, hungry, want to eat you. So what is happening? Every time we take a step, we are thinking. Because we, it tries to create fear in us. Fear. Oh, fear. But when you, we have taken the first step and done the first thing, what do we see? We see that he's there. He's protecting us, and he's with us. Remember that. Remember every time... You get a thought, shall I do it? And you feel the fear, it's just the wolf who are like scaring you, putting fear into you. But we know one thing, as soon as we do it, he's with us. And then he said, go out as lamb one wolf and God will provide our needs. And we're going to talk about that later. And then he says something interesting. He said, when you, okay, well, I, I, I want to do it different. Are you together here? Can, what's your name? Can I borrow you? Where are you from? In Scotland. Scotland. Oh, Scotland. <laughs> Do you know Braveheart? <laughs> Person, can, can you say freedom? Can you say it? <laughs> let, let, let us hear it. Freedom! <laughs> ah, come on. Uh, but I was actually in, in Japan uh, some time ago, and we were out on the street, and we met a guy from Ireland. I said, hey, you're from Ireland. Hey. Oh, I love Braveheart. Can you say freedom? He looked, he's like, he's from Scotland. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, what's your name again? Rudy. Rudy. Have I met you before? No. Okay. Rudy, I want to see how good Scottish people is to find things. I want you to find something for me. Can you do that? I want you to really put your best into it. Are you ready? So I will give you 10 seconds. 10 seconds to find. And I'm going to say now, and you're going to find. Are you ready? One, two, three, four. Now! One. Two, five, three, four, five, six, seven, come on, eight, nine, ten. Oh, he did not find. Out with you. Out with you. Go out. Go out to Brian. You will know later. Go out to Brian. Bad boy, bad boy. Go out. Brian, take him down and hit him. No, sorry. Right, come back with him, come back with him. I gave him another chance. Rudy, come back here. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I give you another chance. I am very merciful. Stand there. Okay. 
Oh, okay, stand up. Okay, ready again. I want you to do better this time. I'm going to give you 10 seconds again to find your wife. Now, one, two, three, hurry up. Three, four, hurry up. Five, six, seven, yeah! Thank you. You can sit down. What do I want to illustrate here? Jesus has never called us to go out and save the whole world. He, he already done it. He said in Luke 10, go out. If you come to a house, if there is a person of peace in that house, stay in that house. So when he sent them out, he sent them out with a specific goal, with a calling to not save the whole world, but to find one person. One person of peace. But you have to know what you are looking for, for you to be able to find it. And when I said to Rudy before, go out, find. <laughs> what? What? It's like the church of Christ today. It's like the body. Go out and make, we, we say like, go out and make disciples. Yes. <laughs> Where? <laughs> so we have like a big calling, go out and make disciples of all nations. But we almost paralyzed in our body because where to start? It's a big world. It's a lot of things to do. What to do? Where to start? But what we did second time was we took his wife, the person of peace. We moved her away. And then second time when we said go and find. Now he knew what he was looking for. And because he knew what he was looking for, he was not standing paralyzed in his body. He was like, okay, where, where, oh, she's not there. Where is she? Where is she? And he was looking, and then suddenly the Holy Spirit started to lead. Ah, and he found her. The same way today. We are called to go out and find a person of peace. What is a person of peace? A person of peace is the opposite of the last thing he's saying. We will also meet people who are not open, and there we just bust the dust off our hands and feet and go to the next person. So the person of peace is somebody where the Holy Spirit is working in their life. Somebody where the Holy Spirit is already dealing. The woman at the well. We read Jesus came to Samaria, John 4. There was a woman at the well. Jesus saw that inside that woman there was a person where they was ready to receive. And that person came to faith and the whole area came to faith. We can read the jailer in Book of Acts 16. One person, the jailer, invited them home, and suddenly the whole household got saved. Cornelius is a person of peace. Lydia, there is people who are person of peace, people who are ready to receive. And then there's people who will not receive. And what we often do, we do that mistake when we evangelize. When I start to evangelize, I evangelize to the same four persons again and again. And those person was not person of peace. Those person was not ready to receive. So I tried, and very often it become discussion. Evolution and science and religion. What about Catholic approach? And what about this? What about this? And we end up discussing and discussing and discussing. And it just takes every energy out of you. And you try it again and you try it again. And go back to the same person again and again and again and again and then you are tired and you don't have energy and you think no people in an island want to get saved everybody's like this <laughs> no not everybody but those people are and we try with the same again and again and again and you more we do you harder is the heart going to be because they're not ready to receive because the holy spirit is not dealing in their life what we should have done is take the dust of our hand and feet and then go Okay, okay, nice. Have a good day. Hey, have a good day. Hey, okay, nice. Have a good day. And because we don't spend all our time, then we have time to find more people. And then suddenly we come to number 15 or 20, and you just have it. One person where he actually listened to you. He like, okay, so you have met God. Hey, actually, I got a dream last night. Or actually, I, I talked with a friend about it. Or actually, I've been thinking about it the last days. A person of peace. So you find one person who actually open to God. And this is what we are called to. What you do with that person is then important, and you're going to hear after a break.